I'm Ruby Jones, and I'm back again with Denver Urban Spectrum. Uh, today, I'm here with a longtime friend and contributor to Denver Urban Spectrum, Mr. Theo E.J. Wilson. Some of you may know him as Lucif Fury. He is a founding member of the Denver Slam Nuba Poetry team, and he's done so much around our community throughout the years. I'm super excited to be sitting with Theo to discuss some very exciting news that he has. Thank you so much, Theo, for this conversation. No problem. Thanks for asking me into it. Sure, sure. Now, um, the last time we spoke was about five years ago, and you were publishing The Law of Action, your first book, um, which turned out to be amazing. You've done a lot of stories for the Denver Urban Spectrum. You've been making moves here in Denver and throughout the country. Tell me a little bit about what life has been like since all of that five years ago. Yeah, well, five years ago, uh, when the book came out, it was kind of an experiment in making sure that I gave something tangible to my fan base. I had built an online following of, at that time, 60,000 people, and it was about making sure that, you know, there was a little piece of me that they could, like, actually have, and my ideas attracted folks. And I wanted to challenge myself to complete a, a work, if you will, of, uh, the best of what I have to offer. And that is the law of action. And right after that, so that was 2016 going into 2017. Yeah. And right. And then so 2017, my TED talk about a black man goes undercover in the alt right got actually, uh, it, it went viral. Right. It went viral. And that was a roller coaster ride like nothing else I've ever experienced before. Yeah, you became known as the new black Klansman. I thought that was a very fitting and interesting title based on what your activities were and what your TED talk was about and, you know, the, the steps that you actually made to infiltrate. This was an infiltration into the alt right in terms of the far right wing resurgence of white supremacist activity. Okay. And I was a lurker, essentially. I was somebody who was a, who would hang out on the chats and kind of, and really kind of just listen in on what was behind the hatred. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I had a good understanding of what seemed to be at the time an existential threat. Like white supremacy has always been an existential threat to black people. Right. And my original impetus was not to find compassion. It was reconnaissance. I needed to know. As a black man, I felt vulnerable for not knowing. And it was just a matter of me being trolled by white supremacists on my Facebook page and getting an inkling into what these digital algorithms were. Back at that time, nobody was talking about echo chambers. It's hard to believe because that's all we talk about now. Mm -hmm. But in 2015, 2016, when I did this, nobody was talking about that. We thought we were seeing the world as it is. Mm. And so I got an inkling of that before everybody else started talking about it. In fact, I'm wondering if my TED talk ended up being the reason why a lot of people started discussing it because it got 17 million views overall. Wow. And, and it, it ended up being, you know, the reason I ended up on CNN talking about the very, you know, racial matters that I've been talking about in my community for years. Mm -hmm. So, 2017 hits and it cascaded into this speaking career that I had worked my behind off to build, finally taking a hold to the point where I could leave my job and speaking full time at literally double to triple the rate I was getting at my job was incredible. And one of the things that happened was I attracted a film agent in New York, a nonfiction film agent. And that year, by the end of that year, I was under negotiation for my first television show. Wow. And yeah, so but since 2017, so that's what happened that very crucial year that you met me mm -hmm. on into literally w within 365 days of me meeting you, I was negotiating a television show. That's amazing. And thanks. Yeah. And so they kept falling apart. I had been quietly filming proof of concepts since then, like since then 
I've been speaking publicly and developing television shows and and all of them had fallen apart until a final two were on my desk last year. And um, no, I'm sorry, this is 2022. So in 2020, Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't come a moment too soon, I tell you, because when the world shut down, I lost all of the speaking gigs that I've worked so hard to build over the last few years. Wow. Well, you know, so, I feel yeah. like it's a long time coming because you've built a huge portfolio of public speaking um, projects and events and things like that. And I would think that would be a perfect time for that audience to be, you know, completely locked into everything that you were doing, your views to be going up and everything. So did you feel like that prepared you even more for what was to come after that? Well, yeah, but, you know, you can't see it when you're in it. So, mm. you know, I, I ended up condensing all of my knowledge from public speaking into now the Spitfire public speaking program. So now I actually have a master class that I made. So that's what that's an, another thing that, 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 that happened. I, I completed that master class in 2020 and began to sell it online. And we're just doing a complete overhaul and revamp of it that's about to launch later on this month. Okay. So so when you mention all the things that I've done in terms of public speaking, that's in Spitfire Public Speaking Program. And I, I had written it, but I didn't develop it until the pandemic mm. because I needed another way to bring in income because – all the public speaking gigs dried up right. when all the schools closed down. So, you know, I had just, you know, my, my daughter was born a month before the pandemic was declared. Wow. So can, can you imagine, like, I got a brand new baby and I had set up 2020 to be my most lucrative year because I hustled super hard when yeah. I knew that my now wife was pregnant. So call me old school, but I believe a man is supposed to provide for his family. Mm -hmm. right. And when I saw that the chips were down, the baby was coming, I did what I was supposed to do. I put the pedal to the metal and it set up an incredible year for 2020. And slowly I just watched it vaporize. Now tell me about 2020 for you. We were all tuned in to the protests around the country, the very, um, the very awakening energy, I feel like. How was that experience when it came to the things that you had been working on um, in terms of race relations and speaking out to and about the Black community? How did that year go for you? Yeah, it was interesting because I was a, I was a big part of the first push to rename Stapleton. It was a major thing. Wow, okay. Right? And so Shop Talk Live, my organization, had kicked up the new wave of it. Now, I say that the new wave because if I were to be honest, the first push was with Juju and Kuma back in the 90s right. to change the name of Stapleton. And then, then as the Confederate monuments were beginning to be questioned and be torn down in 2017, Shop Talk Live said, well, we've got a Confederate monument technically right here hmm. in the name of, of Stapleton. So in 2019, I testified before the committee about to change the name and they said, thanks, but no thanks. Hmm. So, you know, when George Floyd happened, you know, and Tay Anderson took up the torch, it was like he was kind of like the newest wave in completing a, a, a journey that, you know, even I was standing on the shoulders of my ancestors to do. So that was very fulfilling in seeing the name change for Stapleton. I wrote about it in The Color Little Sun. Um, but at the same time, I found myself in a precarious position because as I, as I saw the world closing down, I ended up um, taking a stand that was unpopular with the, my constituency, mm -hmm. my followership. And I ended up working at the Struggle of Love Foundation's food bank because I was, I literally went from TED Talks to food banks because I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. Like it, it all went away. And one of the things that, um, that, uh, coach Hodge told me was that if this economy stays closed, 
these boys that I'm working with right now are going to uptick in the gang activity because they don't have a reason to say no to their homies this summer. Right. Yeah. And so I, right. So like, I'm just looking at it from the perspective of a community activist who works with the hood. If everybody, they can't shut the economy down without everybody agreeing to it. So when you have, at that time, I had grown it to 70,000 followers. You don't know what you really can impact. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. And so I began to speak out. I said, y'all, I, I understand that the pandemic is scary, but I need y'all to advocate for these these stores and shops to stay open. And everybody was like, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. You know, you're going to get people killed or whatnot. And lo and behold, a year later, we saw that 40% of black businesses were wiped out. Right. According to, to, to Forbes magazine. Yeah. The gang activity certainly spiked that summer. There's no question. We saw an uptick in violence summer 2020, and that ended up also resulting in what many uh, school teachers saw, an increase in depression, suicidalism, and self-harm. Hmm. Because we couldn't connect, right? Right. And so my fight ended up kind of being sucked into that and working on the fact that my stance for medical freedom uh, was taken out of context as well, right? So I'm doing and saying things that are unpopular, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact is, to me, they were completely congruent with my progressive and black power stances. They were completely congruent. You know, when you have progressives in a political system, they stand against corporate domination of the people. That's all corporations, including pharmaceutical corporations. To me, my stance was completely progressive and black centered and empowered. Yeah. When I, you know, when the mandates came down, I said, it is, if you look at our history with medicine, you know, if you look at what the Tuskegee experiments have done to black folks, if you look at the things that we've have suffered in terms of James Marion Sims developing gynecology on the bodies of slave women, mm, right? Right. If you look, if, if you look at the way that which we've been guinea pigs and which Africa continues to be guinea pig, uh, can we maintain the ability to opt out if we, if we, if we choose to? Mm -hmm. That was to me was historically informed in line with progressive liberal principles. Yeah, that's a um, very valid stance and perspective. Right. So, but that was, that, that was once again met with unpopularity. So I, I, I kind of pulled back and in late, and in late September, I get a freaking email. No, no, no. In, in late in late July, I get an email. And this is 2020. Agent. This is late July 2020, right? Because okay. that's because that's how my summer was going, mm. being un, being like un unpopular, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, and in late July 2020, my my agent says there is a show opportunity for you. We have. A, an opening for a television host on the History Channel. And one of the first things it said was, are you physically strong? Hmm. <laughs> like, wait, what do you guys, wait, 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 wait. Interesting like, question. <laughs> yeah, right, like, yes, I, I, I am strong. Like, physically, I, I, you know, I've worked out six times a freaking week, uh -huh. you know. And they were like, good. Um, well, there's a thing called I Was There. And we need somebody to kind of go first person into history and involve yourself in doing the difficult things that were done in history. Hmm. Now, me as a black person, I'm like, Man, how far back are we going? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> You're right. History was a little bit more difficult for folks that look like me. That's what I'm saying in, in, in my head. Yeah. But, but I informed the guy, uh, his name's Andy Oz. A W E S Oz. Mm -hmm. And Andy Oz, uh, said, do you have any background on TV? I said, yes, I have a background in theater and, um, I've done, you know, television, you know, in terms of commercials and whatnot. And then he asked, well, what do you know about history? I said, well, there's history in my blood. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you mean? I said, my grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman, mm -hmm. certified red tail. Wow. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, my grandpa was, was a Tuskegee Airman. 
And he was like, wow. And I was, and so I sent him the, 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 the People magazine article about my grandfather. I, he has a trading card. Uh-huh. There's a, there are, there are Tuskegee Airmen trading cards. He has a trading card made by George Lucas on wow. my grandfather's last birthday. George Lucas sent him a limousine for the Red Tails premiere. I'm actually the grandson of one. And wow. I told him, I was like, I bet you you're going to have a hard time finding somebody with a better connection to history than that. <laughs> That's crazy. And so the next thing was the Skype interview with Maria Oz, his wife. Mm-hmm. And so I get on there and I make sure my beard is trimmed up real tight. And, you know, I got to look the part, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And she asked me, what do you know about history? Name me about five or six historical events that you think are very pivotal. Mm-hmm. And so I just named them. You know, I, I believe the question, sorry, was more like, what, like, like, what would you like to see if you went back in time? You know, right. And I, and so my answers were, I'd love to see Mansa Musa. In the Malian Empire at its peak. Yeah, wow. I want to see, I would love to have seen Mesoamerica the day that they were discovered by the conquistadors. Hmm. I, I'm interested in the Cahokia Mounds uh, of what is present day East St. Louis and the earth movers in indigenous of, of America. Mm-hmm. I'm deeply interested in the Nubian Empire and the gold route of the Nile around the first and second cataracts. I'm interested in actually Marcus Aurelius. I would love to see the Roman empire governed by what they say was the last of the five great emperors, Hmm. Marcus Aurelius and, and and how his effect on the Roman psyche uh, made him a, a historical figure. And I would also be interested in the development of the Prussian empire in terms of their technology and how, they did the same things as the rest of Europe without the type of imperialist projects that we see in France and Europe. I mean, I mean, I mean France, France, England, um, you know, Portugal and Spain. Yeah. Well, what I didn't know was that these answers were way out of the box. Right? <laughs> I'm sure you blew her away with those. I didn't know. Hey, I didn't, right. you brought it. <laughs> right, right. Like, like, because... What I found out is other people's answers were more run of the mill. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm interested in like what really happened in 9-11, the Kennedy assassination, like maybe more advanced people would say like what happened the day that the Wright brothers first flew. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But I was in, but you what dove really showed, deep. <laughs> I, I'm actually a history buff. Exactly. Actually. Right. And so. A month or two went by and they said, we're interviewing other people. So I kept my fingers crossed and they said, it's down between you and a few other people. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, September, let's start filming the proof of concept. And I was like, yes, right? Wow. So we filmed two proof of concepts, one in September, I mean, one in October and one in February, 2021. Then I get word that History Channel is interested in somebody else for the role. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait, 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 dude, what, what? And they were like, don't worry, we're advocating for you because we have built a relationship. And frankly, it wasn't anything personal against me. It was they saw the size of the show mm-hmm. and wondered if a bigger name talent should carry it. it. It it wasn't about them not liking me. It was more like the gravity of the show and what was going to be done with it. Right. And so committee films... Uh, and what I, what I found out later was it wasn't necessarily even something that they were fully taking serious. It was a question that people down the food chain took seriously, but it, it, it sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, and I have to congratulate you because, uh, I saw the trailer for the show and it looks incredible. I mean, it looks like one of the most impactful, uh, series of our time. Everybody who I know who has seen it is blown away and so impressed. So you should certainly, 
uh, be celebrating. It sounds like everything came together perfectly because it's going to be a hit. It's really, really good. It feels like it. Yeah. When I got, when I got the scripts, there, there, there are 12 episodes and each episode took about a half a week to film at least my portion of it. And they, they were, so we, we completed roughly two episodes per week, but we shot a lot of it out of order, back and forth. Sometimes we'll shoot one in one set and then we'll come back a month later and complete it, right? Uh But it added up to about two shows per week in a six week time period equaling 12 shows. Okay. And I was only part of the recreations. There are other parts that are expert uh, testimonies, mm-hmm. whether they be professors or folks who were actually at some of the events that they're more recent. For example, the Challenger disaster, more recent, um, o- Oklahoma City bombing, more recent. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so these were amazing times. Everybody on the set was so cool. And there's these special effects, the lighting, the makeup, the costuming, when you get on set, you really are like, oh, my God. And <laughs> it began like it. When I saw Abraham Lincoln, and that was the first episode we filmed was the assassination of, of Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. So his name's Robert Broski, plays Abe Lincoln. He got on set and he had his mask on at first because it's the pandemic. I didn't really get a chance to see him. I went to get a snack, came back to the tent, and his mask was off, and my heart stopped. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I was like, oh, my God. I said, he's got the face, but does he have the height? Lincoln, you know, was six foot four. He's the tallest president. Yeah. Robert Broski stood up, and he kept standing up. I mean, he stood was six foot four. Skinny, the face. And, And from there on, it was casted so well from every angle. The guy who played Timothy McVeigh will make you stop, right? Mm. Um, John Wilkes Booth's guy, um, you know, um, it's just, it, it's, it's unbelievable the resources. It seems like have. there was a lot of like amazing CGI. Was that the case? Like, what was that like yeah. working and interacting with a set that's using <sighs> that technology? It felt like akin to what maybe Marvel Cinematic Universe actors go through. Mm. So much green screen. We filmed, like, I, I remember one of the, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell you, one of the best episodes of the season, without question, is the Battle of Stalingrad, right? Mm. Holy God. So we, we filmed part of it during proof of concept. And if you look closely, you'll see my beard is different in one part than it is the, the, the other part. Uh-huh. That's the only, but you really gotta look for it, right? In the Battle of Stalingrad, we filmed the actual battle sequences in February in Minnesota. Oh. In a, it was cold. That sounds it freezing. Was, it was horrible. It was literally 20 degrees without the windshield. Wow. And then I go into the tent and the snipers, the authentic rifles, the makeup people putting frostbite on their faces. Um, and then when we looked up, you know, like there's an explosion and this isn't a trailer. <sighs> that explosion wasn't yeah. there. Oh, wow. That and was all green screen. That was post-production, right? Wow. There's a, sh- there's a shootout sequence and another I- I- explosion there that was done with like a fan to like blow the freaking like, like the degree at them. Uh-huh. And then the, and then the sky, the sky wasn't green screen. They just cut it out and added the World War II airplanes and the bombed out buildings. And I was like, what have I got myself into? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looks so real. It looks it like looks... you literally were there. Yeah. So that is going to be a good one that the Hindenburg, that was a lot of green screen. The special effects on that are going to be crazy. Um, Johnstown flood, a lot of green screen there. Those special effects, and I've seen every episode now, so I'm just going to tell you, I'm I, I'm so excited for you to see these. They were better than even I thought. Wow, I'm was, excited too. So when are they? When is the premiere? When are you guys getting started? February twentieth. I just 20th. got the date yesterday. I just got the date yesterday, so it should be fe- February twentieth. 
I think it will be 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time, 10.30 Eastern. Okay. Is is when the History Channel will premiere it. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm going to be tuned in. My whole family, we share the love for history that you have. So any kind of, um, you know, more modernized historical Mm -hmm. depictions, we love it. We love the recreations. So about your love of history, tell me a little bit about that. Like what made you this huge history buff and the perfect person for this role? First of all, being in a black historical family, a lot of people don't know this, but there's kind of a tight-knit community of those of us who have descended from black historical figures. Mm. So um, the people who are the descendants of Harriet Tubman, mm-hmm. descendants of Frederick Douglass. I know those two groups are very, very close. I grew up uh, with my sister being one of her best friends was a descendant of, of Frederick Douglass. Um, I'm close with the descendants the, of the Negro Leagues. And so just being in these historical families, you know, certain historical events through firsthand accounts. Yeah. And and so then put that on top of the fact that I'm the grandson of a Tuskegee Airman. I didn't ask for that. That's just how the cars fell. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, you talk to my grandfather, you know, before he passed away and he'll just give very descriptive details about what happened in Berlin. He was there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow. Like, and, and and then on top of that, my father uh, is, I mean, his, 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 he's a black history, he, he's a black Western history buff. He was in charge of, uh, don't quote me on this because it's getting fuzzy now, but he was definitely intimately involved in the Black American West Museum. Okay. You know, so uh, with Paul Stewart, Paul Stewart was at our house. My dad would bring home um muskets and stirrups wow. and he, and 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 his, his library of the black american west is huge to this day he um you know was in the jim beckworth mountain clubs uh, mm-hmm. historical re- reenactments barney ford like my dad played barney ford you know you know what i mean yeah um so in the beckworth mountain club where i grew up you just had to know who jim beckworth was you know what i'm saying um we went to the Oscar Show Film Festival. He went 12 years running. I went about two or three times. And I remember, you know, knowing who Oscar Michaud was, watching these films, and just... So I was raised in history a lot of bit because of, of who my dad is. And Black history specifically completes the narrative of American history. Hmm. And... It seems like when we talk about black history these days, people get all upset and they start calling it critical race theory and all that stuff. Yeah. But what it is, is it's completing the picture of what America is. And I think that the History Channel is very interested in doing that. They um, want... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I was just sp- speaking to a civil rights leader, Carlotta Walls Lanier, and you know she's mm-hmm. lived here for a long time as well. And we were talking about just that, about critical race theory, and um, one of the things that it makes your situation makes me think of is the impact of black yeah. men when it comes to educating members of our community about mm-hmm. our history, about black right. history, about American history as a whole. So the fact that you are in the role and taking the responsibility of not only sharing this with your community, but now sharing it on a national level. Like, I just think that is so amazing. And it seems like destiny, like with your family history and everything, it's great. A a piece of it feels like destiny now, but when I was going through it, it (laughs) felt very precarious. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, what I find is the momentum of your being often creates your luck, mm. meaning the things that you most frequently and habitually do over time tend to pay off in the end mm. because there's a, there's a momentum to it. And so I wouldn't have been able to answer those questions the way that I did had I not actually been immersed in history for the past 30 some odd years of my life. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. 
And when that door opened, the law of action and all of the principles behind your determination and motivations and willingness to actually step into that role, you know, all of that lined up too, it sounds like. Yeah, it did. And one of the things that was an interesting boon, something that was a tool in my tool bag I didn't realize would be so valuable, is my background in theater. Yeah. Specifically theater. Why? Because of how much you have to memorize in theater. So there are long, long tears of dialogue, or shall I say monologue, on camera Mm -hmm. that I'm reciting one historical fact after the next, and I would spend hours a night in my hotel room by myself, me reading to the mirror, reading to the freaking thermostat, rehearsing and memorizing so that I could get these done in one take or less. Wow. Like not one take or, 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 or less, but it's like we're going to spend as little time on my portion mm-hmm. as necessary, but I had a lot to say. And I developed that muscle doing Shakespeare, wow. doing August Wilson. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of people don't know. I understudy Othello for the Colorado Shakespeare Festival in 2015. You know, hmm. like my my background at Florida A&M University, their theater program, all of that added up to the skill that had them be uh, that, that that allowed us to be a smooth production. You know, for me to be the least of their worries, which helped me build relationships. And I, that was something else that they were unlikely to find in another host. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you made it look like a piece of cake because from what I've seen so far, you know, all of that hard work paid off and in a very, very cool way. I cannot wait to tune in. Let me ask you though, I want to go back to what you were saying about the start of the pandemic and when you were working at the food bank. And I want to kind of know your insight as a black man, what can you say to encourage and inspire others who are maybe young fathers who are, you know, trying to navigate our changing world what kept you focused and motivated and really kept you going at a time that could have been a little bit um, disheartening? It, it was disheartening. And one thing that I, I realized, and I always would tell myself, my daughter cannot eat my excuses. Mm. Period. Wow. Um, excuses won't keep the lights on. I've got to figure something out. And so... For some, uh, this is, this is still uh, amazing, but me kicking forward into action, I volunteered at the, at the, uh, at the food bank with struggle of love because that was action. It was going to keep me close to food should our money run out, which it never did, but we got close a couple of times, right? Right. Um, the action of me writing for, the Colorado Sun kicked into gear a speaking gig that somebody saw from CSU. You see, see what I'm saying? Right. That that like brought some money that 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 held me through. You, you know what I'm saying? And so to always continue to keep your wheels in motion, always do what's in front of you. One of the things that I found in life is if you worry too much about the future, you drive yourself crazy. Yeah. What you do is every every picture. Every moment in life comes to you in like a picture. Take care of what's in this frame right here, right in front of you. And that will unlock the next frame. Take care of that. And that will unlock the next frame. And that's all I did. And knowing that at some point the rubber had to meet the road and I had to get out of my own way and stop living in my own mind Hmm. and stay in the real world and be effective there. And that's what pushed me through. That's awesome. I, and I was going to ask you next, uh, what's next and what you see for your future. But it sounds like, I mean, are you, are you just really focused on soaking up this moment? Do you have things lined up, um, that oh, yeah. we can look forward to seeing you in what's going on? Well, so, um, get ready for the, the, the launch of the Spitfire public speaking program. Um, Spitfire public speaking is going to, that's, that's kind of like my baby. Like I, I sat there and, and really drilled down on what made me an effective communicator. Mm -hmm. And 
I used to want to keep it secret to myself, but I don't think that's what I'm called to do. I'm called to give this away because I discovered these secrets. I didn't create them, hmm. which means they're not mine. What I can do is be a lens through which people can focus in on the most effective tools, cutting down the learning time that I had to do it in. Right. And so Spitfire Public Speaking is going to be one of those things that is going to be, I think, very helpful to a lot of people as the world opens back up uh, after Omicron, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, there, People are just going to need an uncommon set of tools. That's what I offer. Um, so I love and, that. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah. I would say I would definitely define you as a presence when it comes to public speaking. So that uncommon wisdom and those tips and that information you're giving to people, they need to jump on it. Seriously. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, um, past, past that, um, the show run is still in the future. I don't know what it's going to be. So it's like, you got to tune in to I was there and you know, there are things that I was able to, like, you know, uh, have my hand in directing in terms of historical accuracy. And there's a couple of things that slipped through that I wasn't able to get my, my, my hands on. It's just my purview as, as a host limits my ability to influence certain things. Right. But I'd be, but I'd be curious to see what people think. And if there are things that we got wrong, uh, which, uh, there aren't many. I'll tell you, we were pretty, we were pretty thorough. Like they have a team team. Okay. Yeah. But if there was something that we missed, I love to hear from it and hear, hear from y'all. And, um, there's already plans in motion for season two, but we got to see how season one plays out in real life. Cool. So you, it sounds like you definitely need the community to step up and support and tune in. Are there going to be any opportunities for like live viewer interaction or will you be live tweeting or anything like that? People have talked about doing a watch party. I'm not sure if I want one. <laughs> like, <laughs> you gotta do the watch party. Don't want, I'll, I'll let y'all don't watch it. Y'all come back. Talk to me. What y'all feel it? Yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I rally for that, and I do encourage everybody yeah. to watch it with their children, with their families. Yeah. You know, this could be a good intergenerational activity, and just, you know, let's talk about history. Let's talk about who we are. I love it. Mm, yes, ma'am, for sure. Well, if there's anything else that you want to leave with our readers, our listeners, say to Urban Spectrum supporters, uh, we just thank you for your involvement in our community for so long and for really stepping up for real showing out. And thank you for representing Denver uh, in the magnificent way that I know you're going to on the History Channel. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you guys for always supporting me. Like when I'm, when I'm in the world, I realize I'm a representative of the community that made me. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you and have a great uh, Martin Luther King Day celebration and mm-hmm. Black History Month, February 20th, right? February 20th. All right. It comes out. Okay. All well, right. I will be seeing you on screen and thank yeah. you again. You have a great day. You have a great day. All right. Bye. Bye.